Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, it's good to be here this morning. As you can see, we're in this series called Growing Into Maturity. And it's a series based on John chapter 12 through 16. And if you remember a couple weeks ago, we, we told you we're going to be building an acrostic on what it means to be mature from the words of Jesus. And so we're building this acrostic, I want you to see this, of the word disciple. That uh, each of these topics is found in John chapter 12 through 16. And uh, so today we're going to be looking at death to self. So I'm glad you came. It's going to be an exciting sermon. Everybody loves to talk about death and uh, especially death to ourselves. It's been a tough week. It's been a tough thing to study. And so uh, I I'm glad you're here. If you'll remember last week, we ended though talking about that these steps are not something that you check off the list. Uh, if you grew up like I did and you grew up in a religious environment like I did, we were always big about checking the boxes and always, hey, you know, hey, I'm died to self, I'm done, check, got it, next, you know, and then we kind of never came back to that. Uh, I, I do want to say this, you, you will work on this. In fact, look at this next statement because we said this last week about spiritual growth, uh, that spiritual growth is organic. Spiritual growth is an organic thing. You, you're not going to get to a point where you're, you know what, I'm dead to self, I've got it. No, it's going to be something you're going to work on from now until you die. All the way, no check in the box, you're just going to continue to work on each of these. Because as we ended last week, we've got to realize, hey, we have not arrived you still have growing to do. I still have growing to do. I still need to learn what we talked about two weeks ago, that Jesus is both Christ and Lord. I love the fact that he fully loved, fully forgives me, and he is my Savior and all that. But listen, where, where the rubber meets the road is this whole idea of lordship. And, and, and listen, we, if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, then that's where the lordship comes in, the whole idea of being obedient. And we have not arrived, every one of us have something in our journey that we should still be working on. The second thing I said was, is listen, you got to forget what lies, by, lies behind. You got to quit looking and back at all your failures, man. The more you look back at your failures, the more you look back at your sin, the more you're downplaying the power of the cross. Now listen to me, you still need to learn from your sin, not, not keep on sinning so you can learn from your sin, okay? I didn't say that. I did say you need to keep that out in front of you long enough to learn what God wants you to know and what you need to know so that you can move 
put behind you and move forward. And just as much as you need to forget your failures, some of us need to forget our successes because many of you are holding so tight to what used to be and what could be that we're not willing to move ahead for the greater thing that God wants to give us. And so we need to forget what lies behind. And thirdly, we need to press on for the future. Listen, I believe God has incredible things for us. Do you still believe that? I do. I, I really do. I believe God has great things for us that he's not done. But here's the problem. For many of us, we can't move on to what God has for us because from day one, since we were born, we've been demanding to have our way, haven't we? I mean, think about it. when you were a baby, you can't remember this. But listen, you had your parents on their toes the whole time. All you had to do was cry, and your mom and daddy were right there, made you the center of the universe, amen? And some of us never grew out of it, amen? We're still the center of the universe. We're still at this point of we want our spouse to make us happy, and we want our coworkers to always seek our opinion because our opinion matters to everybody else's, right? And we want the weather to cooperate with just us because we're the only one that matters. And we need sunshine. And others of you are going, no, we need rain. Others are going, no, we need snow. And so all this whole idea is, is from day one, we've been stomping our foot that, hey, I'm the most important person in the room. I'm self-promotion, self-preservation, self-centeredness. Hey, it's all about me. And somewhere along the journey, you just believe that. And some of you still live that way, right? Amen. Did you say Al? Ouch. Yeah, okay, yeah. Welcome to my world this week. Um, you see, I, I gotta be honest with you, for many of us, because it's all about us, it's created a whole lot of chaos. It's created chaos, noisy homes, stress-filled businesses, relationships, and, and somewhere along the journey, this whole thing, it's all about me, just isn't working. I think that's why Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, in fact, John chapter 12, he starts this discourse because Jesus is getting ready for his death and he, he knew that that was coming. And so we go all the way over to John chapter 16. Look at this. So Jesus in John chapter 16 says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Well, all of this, all this, what, what, what in the world are you talking about? All this I've told you. Well, if you want to know all this and you got to go all the way back to chapter 12 and what Jesus was doing is he was preparing them because he knew he was about to leave them. He knew that he was about to be crucified. He knew that when he was gonna be crucified, he was gonna be raised from the dead three days later. And then he was gonna ascend into heaven and send us the Holy Spirit. So he began to talk to these guys. Listen, guys, I'm about to go away. So here's what you need to nail some things down. Here are some things that I want you to be working on. And so in John chapter 12, we find where Jesus is preparing his disciples for that. Now, to give you a little backdrop, if you go back to chapter 11, in chapter 11, Jesus has just risen Lazarus from the dead, okay? His best friend. He's risen Lazarus from the dead. The Sadducees and the high priest didn't really appreciate that because they didn't believe in resurrections, okay? And so if you don't believe in resurrections and then all of a sudden you have a resurrection, that creates a problem, right? And so as we jump into chapter 12 today, there's all this tension going on in chapter 12. And so we're gonna read about half of chapter 12, then we're gonna talk about this very first thing of denying self. So John chapter 12, verse one, here we go. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, if you're looking at a map, you've got Jerusalem right here. Just to the east of Jerusalem, you have Bethany. It's like a little bedroom community uh, of Jerusalem. So they're not very far from Jerusalem. So here, the setting is that Jesus is hanging out with Lazarus over here and, 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 and Jesus had just raised him from the dead. Verse two, here a dinner was given and Jesus' honor, Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Verse three, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. That's an expensive perfume, okay? And, and uh, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Can you imagine that? That a whole bottle of the most expensive perfume you could think of, she comes, breaks it over Jesus, the whole room is filled. It's just this moment where they're worshiping Jesus, they're reclined at the table. It's this powerful moment. Verse four, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later on to betray him, objected, you think? <laughs> Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. Now, think about this. 
about the average income at Hawkins America is about $29,000, all right? Can you imagine spending $29,000 on a whole bottle of perfume and then breaking it over someone? I don't even know if they make a $29,000 bottle of perfume. I don't know. You know, I have beard oil. I don't wear that stuff. So, uh, you know, and it's like $12. But anyway, it, it's this big moment. And then there's this Judas guy. We all know Judas. Judas was the treasurer, and he's the guy that took care of the money, and he throws a fit. See, we would throw a fit today if somebody took a $29,000 per, uh, bottle of perfume and dedicated it to the Lord and poured it out and wasted it, and we would say something like, gosh, I cannot believe, we could have fed, you know how many kids we could have fed at Hawkins Elementary School with that money? So don't judge him too quick, okay? And it wasn't that he was really concerned about the poor or we are. Verse six, he didn't say this because he cared about the poor because he was a thief. In other words, he was stingy. But he also stole because as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Verse 7, as Judas was throwing a fit, Jesus said, leave her alone. It is intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Again, Jesus is making that transition. He's moving towards his death. He's preparing his disciples. And so at this moment, there's so much significance here of her taking the burial uh, perfume and pouring it on Jesus. And Jesus is making a point. Listen, man, this is what's fixing to happen. In verse eight, in the verse nine, excuse me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, because they also wanted to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And so the chief priest, remember those Pharisees, the Sadducees, those, those high priests, it says, so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing him. Now, don't miss attention here, because remember, Sadducees don't believe in resurrections, right? And now all of a sudden, Jesus has resurrected someone from the dead. And so they said, you know what? This, we can't let this happen because people are coming to know Jesus and people believe in Jesus. They raise this guy from the dead. And so I don't know, this doesn't even make sense to me. I don't know how they got there, but let's go kill the guy that just raised someone from the dead. I mean, think about how illogical that is, right? He just raised someone from the dead. What makes them think they could really kill him, right? And so, so they're thinking, oh my gosh. And then they take it one step further. If, well, we've got a resurrection. We can't, I mean, there's the evidence. There's this dude walking around that was dead. He was in the grave, stinketh, okay? And now he's walking around. They can't do anything about that. So now they're not only going to kill Jesus, they're going to kill Lazarus. Now think about this thinking. Talk about stinking thinking, right? The, the Sadducees are going to kill a guy that's already been raised from the dead. Well, what if he gets raised again? Now we got another problem, right? And then the whole order of thing, you better get rid of Jesus first because if you do Lazarus, he's going to bring Lazarus back again. I, and there's a lot of tension here. There's a lot going on here. I kind of love the narrative. People they tell me I was not, and then the Bible is just going to pour. There's a lot of tension there. There's a lot going on. So the next day in verse 12, a great crowd had come from the festival, who had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they're in Bethany, they're making their way over to Jerusalem. And, and this next scene, we always read at Easter, and it says they took palm branches out, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it, because it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And at first, his excuse me, his disciples didn't understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. And, and you know, that's kind of the way God works for many of us. We don't really understand what God's doing in the moment. It's not until later down the road that we look back and we go, oh, that's what he was doing. But see, it's in that moment that many of us, we, we're so self-centered and we're so self-sufficient uh, and we're stomping our feet. It's all about me that we don't see until we're way down the road and we look back and we realize all along that Jesus, God was working in our journey and how much more it would have been if we hadn't have fought him so much is what's why we're building towards this first thing that Jesus talked about. And his disciples looked back when Jesus was glorified and they went, oh yeah, that's what happened. You ever been there? I have. Verse 17, 
Now the crowd that was with him, when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, were out to meet him, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, this is awesome. See, this is getting us nowhere. This whole planning to kill him is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Isn't that good? Verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. This is amazing. Jesus being a Jew. And now there's these Gentiles, these Greeks, right here, so much going on in verse 20, that all of a sudden Jesus has been ministering to the Jews and has been the king of the Jews and been working with the Jews and going, and now all of a sudden we realize that Jesus is not just for the Jews because these Greeks have come now pursuing him. And look at what happens. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request, sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Not just see him. What they're asking for is we need to have a conversation with this guy. We need to know more about him. And Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And then look what Jesus said. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. See, Jesus knew at this moment, we're fixing to see it. Jesus knew at this moment that his purpose wasn't just the Jews. His purpose was the whole world. So now he had the Jews, and now he had the rest of the world coming to seek him, and they were following him. And then look what he says. We, we don't know if he went and met with the Greeks. We don't have that in the scripture. We don't know if he had a sat down with them. Jesus, what we do have is what he said next in verse 24, which brings us to this whole idea of death to self, where he says, very truly, I tell you, in other words, listen up. You need to hear this, boys. I'm telling you, don't miss this one. I need to very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, Jesus is talking about himself right here. And he's telling his disciples, he says, listen, guys, I'm only one seed right now. You have me now. But what I'm about to do is I'm about to die. And when I die, that seed that dies, is when it's come, risen up, it's going to produce many seeds so that one must die so that the whole world may be saved. It's huge. But then he goes into this, all right? And then he goes, hey, guys, if anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Wow. So, so Jesus, you're saying we've got to hate our life? What, what does that mean? <laughs> Did Jesus actually say and really mean that we're to hate our life? He said it another way. One day he says, you know, if you don't hate your family. So you start looking at that and you're just like, whoa. Because see, the word hate in our culture, it's, it's, it's bad. But there's this beautiful picture in Scripture from the Hebrew. The Hebrew idiom for hate your life literally is an idiom of comparison. In fact, we find it first in Genesis chapter 25 with Jacob and Esau. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Is that it wasn't that God hated Esau, it's that he preferred Jacob. And so there's this Jewish idiom here that God was not saying, I hate Esau, but what he is saying is, is I loved Jacob is that I preferred Jacob. Then we find it in Genesis 29, 31, and 33, where Jacob and Leah, that Jacob didn't hate Leah, but he loved Rachel. He preferred Rachel. And then we have it here in the New Testament, that same Hebrew idiom of preference, of preferring where Jesus was saying that if you hate your life, you'll gain eternal life. He's not talking about that. We literally, we're gonna harm ourselves and we're gonna, we're gonna do something to ourselves. But what he is saying here, there's this picture here, is that, that, that you prefer the God life over your own. That there are, there's a decision to where you're preferring God over our own life. 
You see, when we came to faith in Christ, we started a new life. And what God did is he recreated life in us. He gave us a new life. He put something new, a new heart, a new spirit in us. And this birth brought about a radical and some instantaneous changes in our journey. Some of those instantaneous changes have to do with the spiritual realm that we have now been made right with Christ and we are now holy in his sight. And then the other part of it is we're working that out as we've talked about the last couple of weeks that, that in our obedience, that we're, we're working out our salvation, our sanctification, that we are set apart. And so some of that is instantaneously and then others of it, we're working that out over our journey as it's this organic thing, but we're still us, but we're new. And we kind of live in the same world, but we experience in a fresh, new way, Jesus. See, Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says this, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Can I just tell you this? If you've been made new in Christ, you are new. And look what he says, the old is gone and the new is here. In other words, there's a change, the power of Christ in us. The more fulfilled we are in Jesus, the more we desire to fill our function in Jesus. And so something is happening in our journey that God's priorities become our priorities when we're saved. And that includes how we act. With a new life comes the opportunity and the power to exchange our old way of living with a new way that God's put in us. And we have that opportunity to make that exchange. He transforms us. He transforms our soul, our mind, our will and emotions, the things that make you, you and me, me, but our appetites, our desires, our longings, our fears, our mind, will and emotions. Well, well that's where we get in the most trouble, isn't it? Right? Because what makes you, you and me, me are those appetites and those desires. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of gets sideways, does it? And the source of our individuality, the soul, is also the root of our independence, that, that part of us that fights for our own way and our own plans and our own purposes. And we love the will of God. We'll even clap for it in here. We even want to know the will of God. In fact, it's one of the number one questions people come to me as a pastor. Go, pastor, tell me if this is God's will. We'll even fight for the will of God. But, but here's a problem. It's not difficult until it comes at a cross purposes with our own will, is it? Because then all of a sudden everything stops. All of a sudden this whole idea of death to self. We draw lines, the debate begins, and self-deception starts happening. And we don't say it out loud, do we? We're much more sophisticated than that. It's that internal thing. And then it, eventually it does spill over. And if we don't surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, then inevitably we'll be driven by our own will. I think that's why Jesus starts with this one. Jesus starts very first and foremost to say, listen, boys, if you don't die to yourself, then it doesn't matter what happens after this. This is the most important. And in order to die, you need to understand in order to die, and you hate your life, and you prefer God's over yours, then what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to all of a sudden expand that in ways you've never dreamed or imagined. I mean, God requires death, the crucifixion of our wills, the dying of ourselves before he begins to bring other things into being. And part of the reason he does that is because we're holding so tightly to the now or the good. See, it's not always bad we're holding on to, is it? Some of us are holding on to some pretty good things. And I don't know about you, maybe it's just me and my sweetheart down here saying, right, come on. It's just that, that when I get comfortable, I don't want it to change. Anybody else? Oh, and God, don't come down here and up my nest. Uh-uh. Things are good right now. This is a good season, God. And see, the reason God says, I want you to crucify your will and I want you to hate your life and prefer God because what I want you to do is I want you to let go of what's good so I can get you the greater good. I can get you the greater moments. Some of you are hanging on to not, not even good and you know it's not good of what you're hanging on to because it's all about you. 
myself, what I want. It's not fair that they have this and I want this and you're stuck and you're holding on. And that's why Jesus said, look, if you don't hate your life, then you won't have eternal life. And what that means is, is you've got to finally turn loose of that. And so God can give you the greater good. But many of us are greedy and selfish and drunken and sexually sinning, dishonest, antagonistic. See, Paul gives us that list. He gives us that list and hey, you wanna know what the untransformed life looks like? Greedy, selfish, drunkenness, sexual sin, dishonesty, rage, envy, hatred. And listen, maybe you don't line up to all of those, but certainly some. You see, I think we're all selfish, aren't we? In fact, anybody wanna just admit with me, are you selfish in this room? I'll just raise both hands. Amen? Listen, that's the whole point. Where Jesus is saying, listen, boys, you got to hate your life because if you don't, you're going to be self-centered. It's going to be all about you. Because we're all selfish in some way. See, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. Look what he says. And this is what some of you were. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. You used to be that. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. It means that we can actually have freedom from selfishness. Freedom from self-righteousness. Freedom from self-confidence and self-sufficiency and self-abnimation and self-love and self-pity and self and me and my and mo, oh. We're no longer that. That's why I think Jesus started with number one. You gotta hate your life because otherwise you're gonna be selfish. You're gonna make it all about you. And another passage Paul wrote in Ephesians 4:20. Verse 22, actually, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, our impulses, right? To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. Put off the old self, he says, and put on the new self. Listen, Jesus has already given everything in us it's just whether or not we're gonna take the opportunity to put on the new self and the changing of our minds and not follow every impulse. That's what new life is supposed to be about. Putting off the old, putting on the new. The problem is some of us are holding on to the good. Some of us aren't even holding on to anything good, man. Nothing but chaos in your life. Yeah, you hold on to it because it's the only thing you know that makes you comfortable. And yet here's what Jesus is saying. You gotta hate your life. Crucify the will. I'm telling you, this is huge. And when you begin to do that, when you begin to put on the new self, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things begin to manifest themselves in us when it's no longer about us. When we choose to put God first, deny ourselves before our passions, before our desires, before our impulses. And when we do that, I'll tell you what's going to happen is people around you are going to notice. They are. In a God-first maturing life, the decisions we make in the heart should manifest themselves to the outer world. People should start seeing a difference in us. Your life should start taking shape in a way that shows that, that it's first a real concrete way that, 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 that you are seeking God's righteousness. It's no longer about you. When you begin to crucify the will, all of a sudden you begin to ask yourself that outward evidence that confirms that inward conviction that God, I'm gonna trust you, not me. I'm gonna trust you. What excites me about this is, is that it's a true exchange. It's exchange of giving away ourself. And, and what happens is in the crucifixion of our will is that all of a sudden we have this change in us that God begins to create. <laughs> little by little, we're changed. And aren't you glad it's little by little and not a tornadic moment, right? But see, we'll stomp our foot and I won't change now. Y'all remember the tornado a couple years ago that came through here? Everything changed, right? And it only took about 25 minutes to go from Lake Hawkins all the way across Holly Lake Ranch. 
devastation. Now we recovered from it, but that's not the change God's looking to do in us. See, I think it's more like a pearl, that little piece of sand that's in that oyster, that over time, it begins to coat. And over time, this something that was an irritation becomes something beautiful and valuable. What used to bother us, what used to, God, I want it to change. As we begin to crucify ourselves, the crucifixion of the will, not the destruction of the will, okay? Because listen, some of you think, well, I just, that means, I, I, here's what God's saying. As we crucify the will, to every crucifixion is tied a resurrection. Come on. Yeah. Let me say that again. See, so the reason some of you won't let go is because if you think you let go of that, then what do you have? What do you have now? Can I just be that honest with you? Chaos is not something we want to hold on to, yet we'll hold on to it because we're too scared of what's on the other side. Yet, I think Jesus demonstrated it most for us, not my will, but your will be done. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there's that moment of release of his will. The Savior himself taught us to the relief. God, if there's any other way, God, if there's any other way, let this cup go, but not my will, but your will be done. And in that moment of death, crushing God rose him from the dead. And I believe God wants to take what you're holding on to, if you will crucify it, that on the other side, he's gonna resurrect something that you probably never dreamed or imagined. And listen, it's not in a tornadic way, okay? It's more in just that slow, easy change. My yoke is easy, he said if we'll surrender our will. You see, God's not destroying the will, he's transforming it so that we can experience his will. But we gotta let go of our tight-fisted stuff. In Max Lucado's book, It's Not About Me, he, he talks about the moon. And, and as I was thinking this last week, I gotta tell you, I, I've struggled with this because I'm still selfish, okay? And so I was reading this last week, and I've been reading on this for, for months now. The moon models our role. This is, how, this is what it looks like for us, is that what does the moon do? It does nothing. It doesn't generate light. It's a big old rock up in the sky. It does nothing but properly position. It beams light to a dark world here on earth that is absolutely mesmerizing and even romantic. But it's got to be properly positioned. It's got to be properly positioned. And the moon doesn't complain. It doesn't make waves about making waves. It has all this power, but all it does is just there in the right position to reflect the glory of the sun. <laughs> you see, that's what happens when we take our proper position. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's us taking the proper position to be a reflector of the sun. No self-promotion, no self-preservation. It's not about me even though they told us it was. But what chaos has been created. He goes on to share another illustration about a symphony. That if a symphony didn't follow the conductor, it'd be chaos. Can you imagine? I've been to a couple junior high band concerts. And it's borderline, I'm telling you. I don't envy those conductors up there because I'm telling you, they got their work cut out for them. Because can you imagine if the trumpets decided, you know what, I don't want to follow the conductor. I'm going to do my own thing. And the tubas just bumped off the, the uh, flutes. And what if the percussion just started running around playing whatever they wanted? I know it sounds that way at times. And what if they just decided, you know what, I don't want to play the music that the conductor has. I want to do my own thing. That cacophony of just 
chaos. Nobody would sit there and go, man, that just sounds so good, <laughs> would we? Yet we do in our own life. Yet we do because we weren't made to live this way. We were made to reflect and follow, to follow the king, to reflect. It's no wonder our homes are noisy. It's no wonder our businesses are so stress-filled and, and, and harmony is just so rare. I've been reading lately about the difference between harmony and balance. I don't think there's anything such, it's such a thing as balance because we're always measuring trying to get balance. The only way we're gonna have harmony is when we're just in the proper position to reflect the Savior, just to reflect the Savior. And I'm telling you, we would see changes in our families. We would hear less of here's what I want and more of what do you think God wants? Because as we die to ourselves, it's not about what we want. We begin asking the question, God, what do you want? Instead of the businessman going, how much money can I make? He begins to ask the question of, God, what do you want? It doesn't matter what my name is. It doesn't matter what my account is. God, what do you want? That's the crucifixion of the will. And when it comes to our bodies, this culture says you can do what you want to with it. From women to men. Instead of saying, I'm just going to enjoy my body and give it away because it brings me pleasure. We start asking this question and thinking that, hey, you know what? This body is not mine. It's God's. And I'm going to respect it. You talk about healthy. You talk about a God-centered dying to self. How do we do it? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 3.18 and we'll go home. Paul says this, all of us. Everybody say all of us. With no covering of our faces, show the shining greatness of the Lord as if in a mirror. In other words, we're going to spend so much time going, God, it's not my will, it's your will. That literally, when people look at us, all they're going to see is God the Father. I'm going to spend so much time asking God, is this your will? Do you want this? That when people look at me like looking into a mirror, they're going to see nothing but the face of God on my journey. I'm telling you, this is hard. This is hard. Not my will, but your will. Beholding God changes us. And couldn't we use a change? Amen? So how about you give it a go with me this week? Let me just make an honest confession. Um, this thing of dying to me, you see, I think a lot of times it's not an issue that there's a big sin that we have to die to. Because sometimes it's our freedoms. Sometimes it's our freedoms that God wants to work on us in. See, Paul says that we're free to do whatever we want, but some things are not wise to do, amen? So this last week on Monday, I was studying for this. And if you don't know this about me, you're fixing to learn something about me, okay? And so if you're new here, um, welcome to Summit. But for about 17 years, I've enjoyed chewing tobacco, Levi Garrett. And for about 17 years, I, when I fish, I get a big old chew and I spit. It's gross. Some of you are like, but this last Monday as I studied for this, and I kept hearing Jesus say, not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. I heard God say to me, and, and I've been thinking, you know, this is not good. I, I, I want to have teeth when I'm old, amen? My wife says, I want to have lips to kiss when you're old. Actually, when you're in the casket dead, I want to kiss your dead lips. I'm like, that's sick. But anyway, um, <laughs> here's the point. Last Monday, I took my last chew. And every day, amen? Every day, I've struggled. And I'm not struggling because I've had a headache or anything like that. It's just I liked it. And see, there's nothing wrong with a good cigar. There's nothing wrong with having a chew every once in a while. There's nothing wrong with having a drink every once in a while. Okay? But is it the wisest thing to do? 
And so it just came to a point for me this last week. And listen, I know some of you are like going, dude, you, you've chewed for 17 years. We didn't know that. Like I said, if you knew everything about me, you wouldn't come here. And if I knew everything about you, I wouldn't let you be here, okay? <laughs> it's the truth. Not my will. But yours, Daddy. Not my will, but yours. Would you join me with that? And I don't know what yours is this week. It, it may not be Levi Garrett chewing tobacco. I don't know. It may be key lime pie. <laughs> and it may be something darker than that. But would you get on the journey this week? Because listen, imitation of Jesus, serving others, committed love, impact and faith, present spirit, lasting fruit, enduring faith, all that doesn't matter if you don't get this. I think that's when Jesus started right here. It's the crucifixion of our will so that we become the reflection properly placed of the sun into a dark world. Not my will, but yours. So join me. I'm telling you, this is challenging the snot out of me. And I didn't want to come in today to be a hammer. I want to be a velvet brick, grace and truth. But I also want you to know I'm getting beat up in it too. Not my will, but yours, Dad. Let's start there. Amen? Let me pray for you. So, Father, I love you. Thank you for my family. Thank you that um, we can just be honest and there's no shame or guilt. We're just people on a journey to become more like you, to reflect you. That our lives would be like a mirror reflecting the light of the sun. And God, I know there's some, there's some darkness in this room. There's some things that it's not just as easy as putting down a pack of chewing tobacco. There's, there's some things in this room, God, that the enemy is just creating chaos. And God, there's some of us in this room that are, we're just sitting right in the middle of it, not willing to do anything. So God, I, I just pray for the courage of conviction and repentance to let go of some darkness so that you can resurrect that which is dead to life. God, there's some folks in this room maybe this morning that's never given their life to you. They've never surrendered to you. They've never been raised from the dead in the first place. They've never confessed their sins. They've never declared you as the Lord of their life. God, would you give them courage right now just to pray that simple prayer of God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. And God, I pray if there's somebody in this room that prayed that or maybe they're praying that right now, give them courage to tell someone today. Maybe they go by Grace Place. Maybe they tell someone they came with. God, give them courage to speak of the newness of life. And God, for us in this room that claim to be followers of Jesus, God, help us crucify our will that we would be more like you. And maybe it starts simple, that that grain of sand becomes a pearl. And we do nothing but reflect the light of you. So God, give us courage this week. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Bless my family as we go be Jesus with flesh on. I love you. And we ask it in your name. And everybody said, have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.